something with the voice. I'm sorry, um, can, can you not hear the lecture? No, we don't hear um, it. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm not sure then how I can, uh, do, you can't hear a thing. Yeah, we can't hear you. No, Marisa. not even now. I'm sorry, I, I assume that it would be possible through the share screen have um facility uh, uh there is a, um, a message saying that you have to share which as it, it was um, uh, common at that time had a cut through the site which lo with long trenches and also excavated extensively some areas of course in search of some documentation connected with bible this was their perspective, Ernst Selin and Karl Watzinger, respectively a theologian and, and classical archaeologist. So you imagine that uh, this approach, uh, what one can uh, <laughs> respect it, because of course they get at the end uh, the goal of publishing the excavations. And you see the, the site uh, um, with the main uh, trench one excavated by the later second British expedition by the Incadlan Canyon in front of the Jebel Kuruntul, <clears throat> the Mount of Temptation, uh, with the houses of uh, the Canyon expedition and the Italian Palestinian expedition nowadays. We have spent at the site uh, 17 seasons and uh, we have published plenty uh, of articles and some books uh, 
but um, we have not yet achieved uh, the final publication, which uh, perhaps will, will be our work more than known, because of course, <clears throat> Uh, it is very difficult to, uh, to to narrate what this site is uh, because of several uh, you will see approaches to the site. But let let forget it. You can find all published uh, items in our website or in my personal academia page as of other members of our team. And here you see the map showing the site with the all. Uh, limits of, of previous excavations and unfortunately archaeologists before us used to dump in trenches excavated by others. So a long part of our work has been removing dumps, uh, saving dumps to find items and trying to reconstruct the original shape of this stem which is really amazing and which was, which was larger than it, it is shown nowadays. The archaeological and environmental setting of Tele Sultan is well known, but it's important to understand that this verdant area in the southern part of the Jordan Valley, where it becomes larger, and is characterized by the presence of fresh water, and especially Jericho as benefit of the renowned uh, Ain es Sultan, a spring which gushes out exactly in the nearby of the site. Actually, there are three main springs Ain el Oja, as you see over here, Ain Duke, and Ain es Sultan. The three springs are well known, uh, were well known in the past because were along uh, routes, uh, of course, <coughs> used by shepherds and caravans. So uh, the area uh, has a very long, a constant occupation during time. Ain Sultan um, is just aside a limestone plateau, which nowadays is occupied by a refugee camp, which has, been, has become a, a village or a town with villas nowadays. And uh, it was built just over one of the hugest necropolises of the ancient Near East, while the site has an extension of about seven hectares. You see over here the, the spring of Aina Sultana as it looked like in the 30s uh, well, during Garstang excavations, and nowadays after some uh, restorations. And uh, uh, the Ottoman pool, which was one relevant monument, has been roofed by the Europeans, <laughs> I'm afraid. <laughs> And uh, also the, the, the canals uh, gushing out from the spring, the four main canals which inspired the image of uh, paradise in this garden uh, were also covered. So nowadays the romantic shape of this place of the Middle East, like many others, uh, have been destroyed and uh, the attack to landscape are a very very important issue uh, more important than the scientific results of the excavation you see over here a reconstruction of the extension of the site through time and i just want of course to remark the neolithic settlement uh, with uh, which with more or less four hectares was one of the hugest uh, of the time then of course the Middle and even the Iron Age site were very relevant. So <clears throat> it is still something to do at Tele Sultan with the help of God if he can move his high towards us. And of course, there have been archaeologists uh, um, <clears throat> trying to explore this site. Captain Charles Warren, in a very colonialistic way, at the end, <laughs> after some sounding, some probes, uh, arrived to the conclusion that the, the site was not at all interesting. Then uh, there was the first uh, uh, Austro-German expedition, which had the merit of publishing uh, uh, the first uh, scientific uh, archaeological report in the archaeology of Palestine, which also included a in some ways, the idea of a, of a general stratigraphy of the city, 
Um, and after that, uh, the British expedition led by John Garstang, which unfortunately was not fully published, especially the last season, 1936. But in any case, Garstang had other merits, such as being uh, aware of the prominent Neolithic uh, phase of the site and starting the exploration of the necropolis. This task was then continued by uh, Dame Cadillac Mary Canyon, the staff lady, uh, which used to smoke 40 cigarettes per, per day, and uh, which invented the um, stratigraphic method, cutting through the site, uh, um, enlarging previous uh, trenches. And of course, we are deeply indebted to Dame Canyon in some ways, in others, we have seen the limits of her method when you um, you study horizontally the deposition. In any case, we had in our hands the big books of the Jericho series of the British school at Jerusalem, which were a, a, a very strong uh, help for our uh, work when we started in 1997. Of course, this site has some problems, problems connected with this, its exploitment for modern contemporary politically intense uh, goals, which I suggest to skip and just to keep in mind the lesson of Jericho that is past is over. We must respect it, accept it and keep it as a common memory successes, failures and pa of past societies, tragedies and cultural peaks have no factual relation with, with modern societies, I'm afraid. Heritage. We, have the, we are the heir in the sense that we are fully responsible of the custody of humankind cultural heritage. It's appreciation and transmission to future generations. That's all, I think. And uh, what was our main contribution? Uh, our main contribution was first to establish a site periodization of overall periods at the site, which has never been done. And especially Canyon had uh, made a lot of periodization. She had a very specific way giving names in Roman numbers, which are easy for Italians, but I don't know, <laughs> uh, starting from bottom to top from stages and from top to bottom. Uh, so it's really very, very difficult to uh, keep together all areas excavated by the second British expedition and to fix it into a, a general presentation of the site. And this, we will see in a while, also created problems to other students uh, and scholars which wanted to uh, establish a chronology without keeping separated archaeological periodization, absolute chronology and interpretation of culture. So these three levels, one should, we should keep them always well separated. Then, of course, we have uh, tried to find a, a, a specific dating for our, um, for our finds uh, through radiocarbon, and we will see it in a while. The first stages of the site are well known, and they have been named Sultan Zero, Sultan 1A, and they are from the AP Paleolithic, in the end of the Paleolithic in the Natufian, and the Proto Neolithic, Pre Proto Neolithic Natufian, that is about from the, the 12 ongoing into the 10th millennium BC, when the site was settled by a community, a Neolithic community, which was amongst the most innovative and active in the ancient Near East. And uh, you see here again another picture of the First World War, which gives us the idea of the environment, of the landscape at the time when they settled that there was just a swamp over here. And their first uh, <laughs> effort was to transform this area full of waters because this spring of Aine Sultan gives 5,000 liters per minute. So it's a river of fresh water. They regularized it 
into a pool and they bu started building up canals. So what this community has done is really amazing. They started to do this for letting their activities as hunters, hunters of gazelle. I, I just want to stress that uh, the gazelle in Jericho is named by Linnaeus, gazelle, gazelle, gazelle. That is try th three times gazelle is the, the mother of all the gazelles. And this is very interesting because this gives the hint to understand the fact that this area of the southern Levant is strictly connected with Africa and uh, its environment is similar to the African one and it's full of African animals because it was the corridor with Wadi Araba connected with the uh, African horn from where humans and also sapiens get into Asia. So it's a very sensitive and very important area. Come back to the Neolithic in the pre Neolithic A, a uh, town as Canyon rightly called it. And we start from the Neolithic in this lecture because we are focusing on the problem of urbanism. But urbanism cannot exist without these premises. That is how the idea of something which looks like an organized space for a community started. And this started during the Neolithic. And uh, you see the earliest uh, settlement that we have been reconstructing in the last year with some soundings not far away from the spring has suggested this shape of the site which is also a repetition of the shape of the basis, uh, ba basic arch architectural unit that we will see, that is the house. And of course, you see there is the tower from one side of this important town wall. In purple in the map, all the areas where uh, the evidence of Neolithic fortification have been found. And here I have used the, the word fortification which is really amazing there are two millennia and four town walls connected with the round tower so the round tower even though it was inside and this is quite strange for us because we have in mind our preconceiving it's connected with the, with the european middle age <coughs> or uh, what the crusaders and the islamic architects have done in the near east but it's not like this the tower is inside, but it's connected. Uh, it's a watching uh, tower at the beginning. And it also has, as we will see, important staircase to climb up. And there, are, there were these walls. These town walls were refurbished many times. But what is amazing that they were built with big stones of some hundreds of kilos, uh, even a half a ton. And there was also a ditch which was excavated. So we cannot uh, avoid to surmise that they had already know um, the, the wheel, because the wheel of something rotating to move all these stones from the wadis, from uh, outside, from at least one and a half kilometers, according to the geologists and their study of stones, provenance in the area, to build up this structure and of course the length of this early city wall or town wall is uh, about 800 meters so it's really something amazing for a community of very few people uh, i calculated what was about uh, four, 400 uh, adult individuals which could uh, carry such works then there is, of course, the round tower excavated by Canyon that we have been restudying uh, also for a proper uh, restoration. And we are going also to dig the remained unexplored section because it's falling down. And uh, after 70 years, the section is really dangerous nowadays. And the tower, as everybody knows, is amazing uh, for its round shape. But we'll be back. This round uh, shape also occurs in the basic uh, uh, domestic unit, which for the first time appears in this uh, early town. So the town is uh, 
something including the community and the community lives in houses we used this term i, I named them womb like because the the shape is that of a womb and it's like the womb because it has to protect life inside and this was the life of children and these children are amongst the earliest let's use this terrible term civilized children of humankind in the sense that they were moving steps towards a different way of life not more being hunters and gators and uh, to have to kill every day to survive they just wanted to move to another uh, idea of life that is taking care of life taking care of children also through this fantastic plaster more than 10 centimeters thick that even ants cannot uh, pierce or go through so these houses uh, in some way were the houses where humankind was born and was protected and not only humans but also for example their products what they uh, succeeded to cultivate at the beginning of agriculture Another major invention of this community of PPNA is, of course, the brick that had a loaf shape and which was used submerged into mortar. So uh, this is another fascinating uh, change because it's not everything is not only something uh, which uh, uh, shows a technological skill. This is your the beginning of an idea. And that's why I am interested in it while I'm studying, as we will see, I hope, within <laughs> the time I have, as we will see in the Bronze Age, the birth of a city. But the birth of a city starts from some ideas which were generated before. And one of these ideas is the idea of building, to build in a modular way. And this was invented with the brick building is not uh, is a metaphor building uh, is also building our lives build, building our career building our relationship since then the idea of building one brick over the other became really a, a fixed palimpsest in the minds of the people living there and don't forget that they were responsible in general for one of the greatest uh, civilization using bricks that is that of mesopotamia and egypt for example they were greater buildings since then of course the earliest achievement of this community was the domestication of plants and as you see from this uh, picture taken from an article in paleorion you see that jericho is one of the sites which has more uh, species which were, have been domesticated amongst the earliest eight uh, plants which became uh, uh, the central subsistence of these newly communities this was because of the spring and because of uh, the fact that this community arrived possibly from the hills of palestine where these plants were available in their wild uh, <clears throat> in their wild species and uh, then they were easily domesticated a different a different path was followed for animals and it's more complicated uh, animals uh, were, were domesticated later basically we are dealing with sheep and goats but there are some other animals uh, which arrived later on the donkey and this is a, a very debated topic so I, I don't have time to go into the, the donkey uh, topic but i i think that there, there are several donkeys and uh, the near east has its own and egypt has its own donkeys domesticated more or less in the same uh, millennia uh, jericho also had two uh, wild species which were very 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 um, common as they were hunted also after the domestication of sheep and goats and of course there were gods which had been domesticated before during the paleolithic by the hunters one focus is about bees because bees have a great importance and because in jericho the oldest beehive 
was found in Garstang excavation. We will see also this today. And uh, why bees are important, not only for their role uh, for a community which was starting domestication in pollination, but also because bees preserve in their bottom a microorganism, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is the scientific name, which is a, uh, what we uh, know as a simple yeast. Yeast which can control fermentation of liquids, especially those obtained by this fruit that they were for the first time cultivating in the orchards, in uh, groves, in the just birth oasis. So uh, what we learn from this Neolithic community is of course uh, the ability to be in harmony with the uh, environment, to find uh, really a synchrony with this uh, environment exploiting it in a right way with respect of nature and here you see again the tower and uh, the ram tower has uh, some very interesting uh, features uh, of course it has this backbone that is the inner staircase the entrance and uh, you see it was plastered refurbished there are some changes in, in architecture i can't enter into these details because they will be published in future you see there are lintels and there is a, uh, an entrance and nowadays it is buried for three meters so uh, as we can refurbish and restore it in the future with the project which has been funded by the italian cooperation we will surely show it as it is a 10 meters high monument with a diameter of 8.5 meters. And um, as, uh, the tower was connected to some silos. So now, again, I want to stress that it was a defensive tower in the sense that it, looked, it, it, it was to watch around the site, but inside it was just aside some silos which contained what seeds and fresh water because the tower it's uh, at a, a higher level in respect of the spring so it was in some cases independent with this basin for water but also had uh, to preserve some huge silos for seeds and what were seeds but the most important wealthy uh, value for the community a community of earliest uh, agriculturalists. Canyon found 12 bodies, 12 skeletons at the bottom of the uh, staircase. And uh, uh, these were connected stratigraphically with a layer of ashes, which is the earliest destruction of a very, very long series attested to in Tele Sultan. In some ways, this looks like a symbol. Uh, this ingenuity, this uh, a serenity of the earliest community was broken because according to anthropologists, this, um, this uh, poor skeletons testify that they were uh, killed. They died in a violent way. And even their burial is something puzzling. Uh, the idea is that the, the tower was, after a long time, after 1,500 years more or less of use, was transformed into a funerary monument or something like this, with these people died inside. But who killed these people? And while there is this evidence of a, a violent destruction, this is a big question. And the answer that we can suggest is that there were internal riots, as Kenyon told them. But what means? It means that after that this site had grew up and uh, the oasis had been created, producing uh, wealth, the, the, um, the struggle for power started inside the community. This is a very, very sad destiny of humankind.
Nevertheless, there is a recovery, there is a, a, a new stage, and the new stage is that of PPMB, which is really another amazing stage at Al Sultan. The houses became square, they are juxtaposed one to another, and they created a network like in uh, more or less contemporary Chateau Yuk, a network without streets. So one may suggest that they used to move on the roof and to get into the houses from the roof. The basic of this uh, um, further change was the creation of a new kind of brick, which is uh, three times long uh, in respect of, of its width, and it is created to be uh, put uh, across the width of a, a wall, like here, with three against. And it was called in a very British uh, colonialistic uh, Winston Churchill whale cigar shaped, shaped mud bricks. And uh, perhaps uh, this name uh, is also a, a, an heirloom of the past. In any case, what we have done is excavating PPMB in many spots of the site. And we became aware that the site was, was really huge. So that this is the, the population that we proposed for this site because of its extension of uh, more than four hectares uh, to 2,000 individuals. That makes Jericho really a Nineve of the Neolithic. And now we move to another very uh, important topic, which is connected with the urban mind, with the conceiving of a, 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 an urban society. That is the relationship with ancestors and the starting of a community which is connected by blood lineage. This was really a, a, an innovation during the Neolithic, as everybody knows. And what characterized the Fertile Crescent in uh, pre pottery Neolithic A and B, both, or C, uh, I'm not uh, specifically a prehistorian, and I don't like fixed uh, terminology. So you can use whatever you want, uh, you understand what I'm referring to. I'm referring to this phenomenon of skulls separation. And skull separation is attested over a very wide area. There are more than 100 attestations. <coughs> And uh, I would say, because of the unpublished material, between 100 and 200 skulls, separated skulls in the Neolithic or the Near East, human skulls, of course. And uh, <clears throat> of these, 46 have been found in Tele Sultan. So Tele Sultan is a, a very important uh, uh, source of evidence for studying such behavior of the Neolithics, and uh, it's, it is clear that they preferred separate skulls in Tele Sultan of humans and not, for example, of cows, of bovines, as it was in <coughs> Chataluyuk. And uh, we try to, to, to grasp the meaning of this behavior you see here a beautiful dunat altar which had five children according to canyon sacrifice because they had the terminal vertebra still in connection in the skull buried in the foundation of the cult installation and the cult installation in the middle had an hollow containing burnt seeds and fruits so each time that it was replastered they reput this material which looks really like offering uh, the <coughs> products of agriculture uh, to some entity. And here again, separated skulls in triads buried together. Uh, this reminds me the Enneads of the Egyptians, so something quite strange. In any case, what is clear is that skulls, that means the face, the individual, becomes something of interest for these humans. They are interested in keeping the relationship of the life <coughs> of one individual. This will be, not, and we will see also his physical presence they want to keep in time, to preserve for generations. 
this is really one of the basic uh, wills of humans. We want to continue to live with our body. <laughs> and um, it's, it's really amazing to see how this force is strong. Uh, we, uh, the Italian Palestinian Expedition, found another burial of a, of a skull of this kind within a cyst, with a mineral it, but mm, <clears throat> there were many found also by Canyon and, and Gerson. And you see here some um, burials of skulls in, in a, 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 a well established uh, location and <clears throat> orientation. This is in connection with the house. This is in nests, as uh, Kenyon used to call them, uh, underneath a house or within the walls of a house. This is common in these PPNB contexts. There are also floors made with human bones buried. They have been found recently in, a, in an amazing site in uh, the Wadizarka area where we are digging in Batrawi, in the site of Karayan by a Spanish expedition. And this is really uh, uh, something which let me think about the another mental innovation of the Neolithic, that is the uh, basic idea of the seed which dies and then can rebirth, re reborn. And this seed is the symbol of life. So barring pieces of human bodies hides at a future life, a, 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 a new life uh, which can come again. And here, another basic innovation of PPNB that is pyrotechnology. That means the invention of a mortar and of a plaster, which can be used uh, widely with uh, incredible success. As we see uh, in these pictures, you have plaster of 10 millennia, which is still uh, working. And uh, when the workers, uh, by mistake, try to wash it with water, I screamed say, oh my gosh, now everything is lost, while the water went out and the floor was cleaned after 10 millennia. Uh, during PPNB, the separation of skulls had a further transformation, and uh, everybody knows the 13 specimens of plaster skulls found by Canyon spread over the Amman Museum, and uh, of course, uh, London the <coughs> and Oxford. But in any case, this, um, these plaster skulls remind us the transformation of ancestors in something which uh, you want to worship. But in, in other, this means that the owner of the skull, which was to be shown, was to stress his or her relationship with the ancestor. So the idea of lineage and of family started, I'm afraid, in the Neolithic. And there is another point which is of great interest, that analyzing the mortar, this plaster, it came out, out that it contained iron dioxide. And iron dioxide is a basic component of blood. So my suggestion is that these uh, skulls were made with clay and blood, a plaster made of clay, uh, gypsum and blood. And blood had a meaning, as is known very well to any Orientalist uh, studying uh, Mesopotamian mythology. And in origin of life and the creation of humans is done by the gods putting together clay and blood, where blood means life. The Bible simplified or changed this old, old uh, <clears throat> Near Eastern tradition, substituting blood with this, the Holy Spirit, with a wind, um, a wind. Uh, but in any case, 
the meaning is the same is giving life to this uh, material clay so uh, it's really amazing to see that our earliest gods or idols have been created in the way that we describe humans were created by gods and uh, you see that uh, uh, also seashells were put in the eyes and uh, this is of interest because uh, in Jericho these eyes were not painted it's sometimes the skulls are painted of red and um, but the eyes were they were not painted and this but they have just a, a, a free line and this is i think this is a subject that should be further studied and age and uh, gender of of skulls are mixed that means that uh, there was not a category which was to become a worshipped ancestor there was not only male old man no no it was someone who died even if he was young perhaps it's better which can protect our clan so uh, that's why we have uh, many women men and the age is is uh, across from 13 to 30. and you see the main pit where the greatest group was found by canyon but now these skulls give us uh, the opportunity to extend our study of this really amazing pre neolithic B feature of Jericho. Because in Garstang, in an, an unfortunately unpublished see, last season of 1936, found two pits. These two pits was number 190-195, were at the opposite extremes of his uh, uh, sacred area of the Neolithic, an amazing uh, Neolithic sanctuary, which uh, uh, has been proposed to reconstruct for tourists uh, in the big hall that is now left in the site. So in the future, perhaps you will see again this, this uh, building. We have been able to dig all around it and to connect canyon excavations in square e, uh, E1 and E2 to the Neolithic shrine excavated by Garston, which some amazing finds, such as a small miniature mask, which reminds us the collection of masks found in all contemporary or even earlier Neolithic sites over the country. Then the earliest animal figurines, which of course have to be connected with domestication of animals, and to let's say quite strange burial even though the crack is later is due to earthquake so this is not a separation of skull but this is really amazing because the the poor guy was buried with a big slab over it without no respect of his body so garson suggested that this was due to uh, some some ways of of uh, negative uh, uh, behavior of the buried person and you see here that um, again there is a, a, a clear distinction of the two phases in the last ppnb phase there is this amazing evidence the sanctuary is still existing not far away there, were, there is one of the two uh, favisse that is a burial pit the other is over here and the two favisse concealed what? Concealed statues made in, uh, in pieces. Everybody knows only this head, but actually we had we could reconstruct two groups of a triad, so six statues at least there were at Tele Sultan, uh, and they were made of plaster with reeds inside and they have been carefully painted in association with this find there is also the earliest beehive which was was all made of clay 
uh, unbaked clay in a very, very uh, uh, interesting way. So before the invention of pottery, uh, these extraordinary finds show uh, as uh, which were the most important uh, symbols of early Neolithic, uh, um, of Neolithic, PPND, sorry, and <clears throat> pre pottery Neolithic uh, religion. And here you, you see, you know very well this, this guy. And I just want to show you uh, the painted strokes, the bird, the eyes which were not painted. And this makes a difference with the comparison that you all have in mind and this diadem or a crown which is on top and which is painted in yellow and which may be connected with the moon. In 2014, I had the chance of finding out the legs of this head because uh, in a very strange way, Garstang gave to the fathers of uh, the Dominican fathers of the Colby Bleak a box with the other pieces of the statue. Uh, he didn't give this to the Rockefeller, but gave uh, the pieces to the fathers, uh, the Dominican fathers. And so they shipped it to the Louvre. And only in recent times, there have been the uh, awareness that the legs, the two missing legs, belong to the head. And I wonder if in future, this was a reconstruction in um, in the Israel Museum, but I, I, I don't like it. And I think that the legs are this, and uh, the, I hope that in the future, the Palestinians could, uh, may have back old pieces and they, in the um, museum at the site, this statue can be on exhibit. I will see. Uh, and he, here you see that the foot has six toes and this is really a feature which may support um, the interpretation of the statue as the representation of a god because these monsters in uh, in latin a monster means something which comes from the world of uh, um, of divine so the comparison there was another one very bad condition founded by Kenyon in Trench One. And of course, there are 34 plaster statues found in Ain Ghazal, well known, which are really similar, but not identical to the Jericho uh, guy, the uh, Jericho Moon uh, uh, figure. So back to, um, we, we climb up and we reach the following stage that is called pottery neuritic and which is quite uh, complicated to be summarized because it's a, a period in which there is a, an overlap of horizons and in some areas uh, we call it calculitic in other in other areas we call it pottery neuritic in jericho we use this term and e even though there is really a gap during the late calculitic period which corresponds to well-known Gassurian period. But I don't want to annoy you with these things that the archaeologists like, but the other people, they don't like. And uh, you see that there are these, they were called troglodytes because they used to live in, um, in, in small houses sunk into previous layers. This is a subject that I, I would like to explore because I think it's not so um, easy to live in uh, one 0.5 meters wide house. So uh, we are now uh, going to re excavate some parts of this. And of course, Pottery is famous and it's also interesting because of the invention of the pottery. I don't know if now I can have. Uh, um, you see that the, the, the earliest features of this pottery is that it is very, very fine, very well. Uh, made, handmade, and painted. And you see, it's decorated by strokes and uh, with this red color also inside. And uh, we have been studying this, the origins of pottery, which is, uh, of course, a very fascinating topic. And a student of us identified a mineral which is typical of the Jericho area, which is called pamplite. 
that always occurs in Jericho specimen. So now we are wondering if we can get some other uh, specimen from other sites. If Jericho actually was one of the earliest uh, uh, pottery producing centers spreading this uh, luxury item at the beginning all around the area of southern Levant after uh, this uh, regression as canyon considered P pottery neolithic pn i don't think it's a regression is a is a other culture then uh, there was a hiatus, uh, possibly because uh, due to a terrible earthquake which used to hit Tel Sultan in the Jericho Valley, in the Jordan Valley, uh, this spring had some problems and uh, the, the local community moved to the banks of Wadinu Eima, about two kilometers far away, not far away from Kirbet el Mafchar in a site which is called Tel Mafchar and which has been excavated by the Norwegian Palestinian expedition. You can find information in the web about this. While Tel el Sultan, about at the half of the fourth millennium, was resettled by a new population, a new community. This is very interesting because it's one time that we have really evidence that there was a complete change someone arrived we are always waiting people arriving in this country I, I hope they have stopped to arrive and they can find also a way to live all together in peace we need this and uh, this one they arrived and the, the site was abandoned so they could uh, settle they were agriculturists they they already started with the circular architecture with domed houses of course, the dome in the picture has uh, have not been are not those of Tel El Sultan. The, the picture is from northern Syria, and uh, mm, this uh, northern quarter was excavated again by a different expedition. They even found, as you see, this picture is unpublished. They even found a, a shrine and uh, with uh, a very interesting uh, round circular installation aside and this Gar garstang called babylon shrine because at its time in the early 30s uh, it's the time of the great expeditions in the diala river so and uh, there was also uh, the americans at nippur so the idea of this kind of benches uh, uh, was uh, that it was uh, an architectural feature of ancient Mesopotamia. And we cannot exclude it uh, be just because it was said one century ago. Uh, it's a, a nice suggestion, but we must find more proofs. One of the main uh, achievements of Garstang was the uh, discovery of the huge necropolis, and especially of tomb A, which is a familiar tomb which has been used for the old Bronze Age, early Bronze Age, from EB1 to EB4. So that is very interesting because it uh, <clears throat> gives really a stratigraphy and uh, of, of a, a huge familiar group. And there is even attested the passage from separated burials. When they arrived, they were carrying skulls of ancestors. I don't know how, but from the people of uh, 2000 or more year before and those there was this uh, recurring um, tradition that they also used to separate the beginning skulls after a certain while these seminomads which settled and became again agriculturalists started to bury people in a primary uh, deposition and with primary deposition we also uh, became aware of this uh, tradition of uh, burying someone in with this gesture, which is also known from one, the two few or two or three few iconographic evidence uh, of, of Palestine. And here you see other uh, items connected to these burials and a general summary of, of our finds in EB1 is published in Italian in Roosevelt's first volume. 
So I, I just skip this because we have not seen yet the origins of a, of a city and we have to pass through another major um, switch change uh, which is attested for the first time during what is called early bronze age 1b that is the egyptian connection we have published many studies about the did you know that there is egyptian and any egyptian hiding stuff what is evident is that Cherico was connected with egypt through i think wali araba and the sinai and uh, they try to imitate egyptian items and so there is evidence that there was a local elite which was building and transforming this village which was growing because of the uh, because of agriculture because they could produce more than they consume and and this led to the creation of a proper city as a premise i am compelled to mention this this article in the journal radio carbon because you know that uh, as we enter in the bro early Bronze Age, there have been changes and raising of absolute chronology, which uh, from some point of view, one could even uh, uh, forget because uh, it's not important for the interpretation of a site. But you, if, if, if you want to connect it with the general historic interpretation, you need to fix in radio carbon and as the article of reggae metal where it blah 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 uh, has used jericho in a wrong way we spend two years and a lot of money uh, to do new analysis um, to fix uh, this stratigraphy and chronology and what came out from our side we have not the courage of that team to extend their own results based upon a one bulk of one meter by one meter in uh, Megiddo to the old Palestine. We just say what we can say in Jericho, where we can control stratigraphy as archaeologists, not as physicists, but as archaeologists. And as archaeologists, we connected stratigraphy, as we will see, uh, the location of the seed, the dated seed to stratigraphy, we used the already published uh, sections by Kenyon. And the final result is this, that is more or less a, 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 a confirmation of traditional chronology with very uh, small raising in some cases. And we could even be more precise in the definition of early bronze 2 b and a i want to sh to stress that eb2 is neglected unknown misinterpreted and sometimes cancelled by archaeologists i don't add any uh, <laughs> adjective to this archaeologist archaeologists from uh, uh, there are schools uh, which don't like eb2 i don't know why so while the B2 is exactly the period where what we call a city starts in the Levant and especially in the Southern Levant. And the economic foundation of the rise of a city is in Tel es Sultan, which is the case study I can uh, speak about, the availability of a large quantity of fresh water, the availability of cultivable land in a, an extension which is um, more than they needed for their their own the, the number they were so the accumulation of food supplies especially especially cereals and legumes but also fruits uh, which were dried up or which were transformed in liquids with the control of fermentation and then of course due to this accumulation they could buy they could uh, collect raw material such as stone, stone, wood, and copper, salt, sulfur, and bitumen from the Dead Sea. Please, attention to metal, because metal is decisive in this phase. Is is less attested in some ways in the archaeological contexts, 
uh, we have not unfortunately finds like uh, Nahal Mismar for the AB2, but we have some hordes, and it is clear that metal was a crucial economic element at the beginning of AB2. We dedicated a book to this, Roosevelt Five. Uh, it, it has had less readers than the readers of my novel, uh, Jericho, The Revolution in Prehistory, which are more or less 30. Hope that these lectures can uh, suggest to someone more to read the book or read at least the, the three pages which are of interest for him or her. Here you see the main feature which marks the beginning of a city, that is the building of a city wall. A city wall is not a, a wall to cure. The city wall is a, a wall which has been built by an institution using the same bricks all around the kilometer of length of the city wall. And uh, you see that in, um, in Jericho, it's very easy to identify the earliest city wall because in sections is always the uh, lowest one. And it is made of dune yellowish bricks as Garstangen Canyon defined them. And this is the wall built at the eve of the third millennium uh, during at the beginning of early bronze too. What, what was the perimeter of this wall has been reconstructed also by us, especially this area has been identified by the Italian Palestinian expedition. And uh, the wall at a second in a second phase, that is during early bronze 2B, was given horse-shaped towers. Unfortunately, we know only two of them, but there were, and these uh, in some ways changed the um, urban uh, picture of Tel El Sultan. Their gate was unfortunately un underneath the modern road, and uh, the, the wall has been traced uh, all around uh, the Tel. In this crucial area, you see here the excavation by Garstang, also this partly unpublished, with the EB2 material underneath the road. And there was a very, very amazing find by the Italian Palestinian Expedition 2017. We have found in a house, in the back room of a house or a workshop, a set of shells of mother of peel negros shells which were one uh, of different uh, dimensions to be a, really a set of five shells uh, containing the oxide of manganese, which is kajal, what you use for make up the eyes. And uh, the amazing uh, discovery was that as we uh, uh, showed the, the shells to the experts to know the, um, the species, it emerged that they, they were Cambardia rubens, that is a nilotic species, which only lives in the Nile. So there were no doubts that these negros shells were imported from Egypt, and even the dioxide of manganese was taken from Sinai. So this was really a set for makeup imported from Egypt, according to stratigraphy and radiocarbon, which is quite complicated from riverine context and animals, but in any case, the setting is at about the 2850 BC, that means the second dynasty of Egypt. So exactly in this crucial time, very, very far in the past, the Jerichoans wanted in the earliest city that, as you see from this map, was given also as the main street running north south and we will uh, see it uh, in a while uh, wanted to 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 mark that there was an elite with with makeup eyes again the evidence of uh, uh, 
the um, the fact that the spring what was inside the city and even eb2 shirts found in the canals thus test just thus testifying to the fact that the oasis was cultivated uh, and was at the origin of uh, this uh, urban growth and that the urban growth was connected to the uh, use employment of bovines of cows cows were domesticated earlier in ppnb but they were not common they became common in this period and of course because oxes were used to plow and uh, cows uh, can really help the community especially for children to have a distinctive um, demographic growth so uh, it's not surprising what we will see that uh, bulls head are a symbol in this community in the meantime uh, standardization and specialization of pottery wares starts yeah you see the abidos were but there were many other uh, productions and shapes so the general picture of the eb2 is that there is a city and this city is diverse in respect of what we know from anatolia syria mesopotamia and egypt it, this city is uh, is a, a small uh, dimension and intensity uh, urban model so there is a, in any case there is a, <laughs> a a relationship between the site and its catching area its territory and there is the presence of heavy fortifications which imply expensive use of labor and materials and the existence of an institution paying and organizing all this then there is an inner spatial and functional differentiation and we have gates streets public buildings markets and necropolis then there is evidence of wealth accumulation metals precious stuff sold but also great quantities of agricultural product you have seen that picture with where in, in there are quarters full of silos for uh, containing seeds, barley, lentils, uh, peas, chickpeas, um, figs, all these are found in great quantities. Adoption of a tulling system, we don't know if this they, they had reached writing. This is one main uh, ghost. Is there writing? uh it seems not because uh, the dimension of the phenomenon was small and they even don't need it. this is the traditional answer i don't think i think that it, it, it was impossible to to be part of a system where in syria in mesopotamia and in egypt they had riding and being part of it without riding there should be some kind of uh connection to the this writing system one indicators may be this uh, clay tokens seashells pierced seashells and of course the practice of sealing but uh, we don't uh, we, we don't know uh, i think that um, there is still time and space for excavation to find something which is unexpected precious metals exchange evidence is given by the small balance weights and i hope that there were th there are many then social differentiation is visible in tombs and there is labor organization of course for building and maintenance both of canals and of the fortification system of the city walls and there is evidence of craftsmanship and art uh, and there, there is a, a large part of this wooden or inlaid and uh, of course nests uh, that we don't see no see no more and even tapestry and uh, carpets and then of course uh, summarizing material culture specialization and standardization is another evidence of this urban diversity 
So here you have a general glam of the um, of the of the town of Jericho uh, towards the end of the EB2 when a terrible earthquake uh, destroyed it, and this earthquake also occurred in another site. So there was a swarm of earthquakes, and uh, um, this really uh, provoked at least reconstruction of these sites. And there, this reconstruction is a proof that they had a solid economy and that they, this, this, that this destruction were not brought by human hands. Otherwise, they could not recover because human hands take away the wealth of the, the town and then the town has no means to be rebuilt. While as apparently uh, their <clears throat> reservoirs were kept, they could reconstruct the city. And the new city of the early bronze tree is really amazing, is again a, a, a very impressive town with double city wall, all made of bricks, with an overall width of more than 15 meters and even a ditch outside. And here you see that we tested, we excavated other section of this wall, which had been already cut through by Canyon and investigated also by Garstang. Here you see the inner main inner wall, the outer walls, and a blind room filled, filled up with kawara, that is pulverized limestone, and which was taken by Garstang by mistake as the ashes of the uh, destruction brought by Joshua. And this is quite amazing because, by the way, one may suggest that as Joshua took the city, there was not a fire, it was an earthquake. So why they were so excited by this? I don't know. Uh, people get crazy when uh, the horns of Joshua sounds. Here we found a, a remain of the original plaster on the main inner wall. So it's really nice, it's amazing to see that the city wall was plastered in white. So this line in the landscape, imagine it, in the verdant oasis, then the end there was this uh, uh, prominent tell with this white city wall. It's impossible not to think to the description, for example, of Tibes in Egypt. And you see that there was plenty of uh, um, wood used inside the city walls to reinforce as chains and this is a response, a human response, a community response in architecture to the challenge, to the hazard of earthquakes. So they transformed the building techniques, also including uh, uh, empty spaces in between uh, stretches of the walls, so that if some wall would have collapsed, it had collapsed um, alone without uh, all the other part. You see the wood is tamarisk and of course the oasis was generous and we even found um, a wooden beam of a poplar with 100 rings that we sent to Dr. Kuneholm but he could not connect it to any known series for the third millennium of this area. So we have this piece of evidence floating alone. Nevertheless, uh, so the city wall were, had a, a three purposes, which are very strictly connected with the idea of city. One is to protect, of course, the city and the state, because the city is the center of a territorial state, and to uh, uh, state uh, uh, its urban status. The second was to offer labor to non-urbanized semi-nomads -nomad, seasonally camping in the oasis, thus including them into the urban system. This is a very critical point. It is important, very important to have these guys 
inside the urban system otherwise they would revolt against the city third dominating the landscape around the city anything at it anything at it as a city state and showing the power of the ruling institution so this is a drawing showing the corner tower to the northwest as uh, uh, the town uh, would look like here yeah, we move to the inside the city wall and uh, uh, you see that we have a built up main street which is really an extraordinary feature because it was used for 500 years and the, str the street was always refurbished and the the houses which are many on both sides have been reconstructed many times like mushrooms they continue to uh, to grow up and we have now uh, <clears throat> excavated more than it's visible also another section these houses were full of of uh, material culture uh, giving a, a good idea of what was this society uh, at the mid of the third millennium BC. You have seen also the imported Kilbert Kerak and the local imitation of the Kilbert Kerak. So we have the two, and we have uh, uh, clear um, evidence that there was a northern connection, a northern coastal connection at the mid of the third millennium. And here we move to the main building, which uh, unfortunately has been excavated by four different expeditions. The green part is the one we are working on nowadays, while the other parts have been excavated by the Austro-Germans, Garstang, Canyon. And uh, another big difficulty of this building is that it is built on three terraces, as all the other palaces. So you find that the upper terrace of EB3 Palace is at the same level, uh, for example, of the middle terrace of the Middle Bronze Palace. Then the Middle Bronze Palace actually have two palaces. And uh, then over it, there is the middle building, which is the late bronze uh, residency. And then we have a Hilani or an Iron Age building. So. It's a very complicated stratigraphy, very badly preserved, but we are working to give you a final picture of the Spring Hill with all these uh, centers of power. And of course, I have to say that the Spring Hill was the place from which you can overlook directly the spring and connect it directly with the spring. And this is the reason why it was the seat of the palace. In the palace, uh, several important finds have been done, including these jars, which uh, are made of special fabrics just for the palace. And some of them were seal, uh, seal impressions. These seals are schematic seals made of wood, possibly. And uh, they depict animals. Here you see a an, an lion catching a gazelle which is a very common uh, subject in this uh, area. And you see that it also occurs on the most famous tree of life, uh, the mosaics of the D1 of Kirbet al uh, made by the Khalifa Walid II, about 747 uh, um, AD. So uh, this is, uh, really fascinating. From the palace, there are evi there is evidence of, of counting, of uh, uh, waiting. There are special vessels, and uh, it is possibly from this context that these beautiful ivory camps, uh, <laughs> which is now in the Palace Archaeological Museum or Rockefeller Museum, and there are al also other finds. Uh, from the same, uh, from the tombs, uh, coeval tombs showing these bull heads, which are apparently of a tradition development in Palestine following a Mesopotamian influx. So, um, this is really interesting if we connect, reconnect this symbology to the uh, use, common use of bovines, cows 
in this period. There are other finds showing that the palace was a palace. This is the only place where there is evidence of uh, copper items, an axe found by Canyon, and a dagger found by the Italian Palestinian expedition. Then there was a maze head. There is a tour net or a potter's wheel, which is very nice. It's very important because uh, we have noticed the same thing that is collecting in the palace workshops of this uh, basalt round uh, potter's wheel in the palace of Batrawi, which is almost coeval. And this shows that the power wants to keep the means of production in its hands. And of course, this uh, let us uh, start with the connection to the um, issue of metal exchange and production, which is which characterize this phased EB3. And uh, we, we have to mention Wadi Fainan. We have even to mention Timna because there is still open the uh, hypothesis that it was also exploited in the third millennium. And because I think that the copper route to the Sinai was the reason why they were connected with the Egyptians. And here you see one of the most beautiful finds from Tom's A114 by Canyon, which is now in the Amman uh, uh, National Archaeological Museum of the Citadel. And uh, this is to show that weapons connected with power, connected with metal import, uh, make the palace the heart of the city. And these are all the uh, elements which uh, which show what is a palace and I, I want not to annoy this this was for a scholar who sometimes has dubbed uh, this definition for our buildings these are public buildings which are five times larger than uh, common houses and which are full of items that you can find in the houses so this is very simply what is a palace the palace was heavily burned at the end of this stage of the city as the old city. And this destruction was brought by human hands. We don't know who has done this and why, but we know that it was human intervention that uh, as it was so uh, radical and so systematic that everything was burned, the city could not recover. and was abandoned from some decades in the meantime some new groups arrived and of course as we are in the homeland of the Imkazin Canyon we have to mention the Amorites in the meantime that we try to give a definition and I think that ancient DNA can help in giving a definition a definition also but keeping in mind that a change of population is not necessarily a change of culture and that a change of culture is not necessarily a change of population because the two are separated. Otherwise, we go back of a century and we start again to speak of the spirit of, of peoples. And here we are in the EB4 which is very, very interesting because, as you know, the Jericho Necropolis has given a great contribution to the knowledge, especially in the last century of EB4, the Intermediate Bronze Age. But um, as you see, uh, it, it is also allowed to compare data from the Necropolis with data from the Tel. And what happened on the Tel is really interesting. The earliest settlement was just on the summit of the Tel, it is the Spring Hill, and then it spread over all over the uh, ruins of the huge Neolithic and especially bronze, early Bronze Age town. Here are the materials, here are the earliest evidence just upon the destruction of the EB Palace of Tanurs. And you see the earliest beaker of 
EB4A. I don't want to enter to this terminology, but this is for us the earliest stage of EB4. When they just use this kind of decoration, combat lines were not yet used. In this stage, also, we can put a very important find by Selin Watzinger, which was a hoard of copper items, including a beautiful epsilon or a crescentic shaped axe adjoined with a piece which transformed it into what will be in the future the famous phoenix traded axe of the beginning of the successive phase that is the middle bronze one so you see uh, how many interesting points are there are then of course a very fast overlook of the uh, necropolis which has been studied by Daria Montanari in a book, book which she published on the uh, weapons and then we arrive to the what was to be the bulk the center of my lecture but <laughs> time is expired that is the town of the second millennium BC when Jericho was a powerful Canaanite city encircled by a very complex fortification system including a rampart and with a palace and a temple in the middle the fortifications are at least three the earliest is dated to the middle bronze one and is consists of a solid mud brick wall at the foot of the original tell with towers, rectangular towers. One was excavated by the Italian Palestinian expedition. The other is called East Tower, was excavated by Garstang. Then there is another fortification system consisting of a supporting wall over here called carvilinear stone structure um, uh, in MB2 between 1800. Uh, 1650, which supported a rampart, a traditional rampart with a, a beautiful glassy revetment of limestone, mortar, and clay, and which had a massive mud brick wall on top, which is the second fortification system. And the third is characterized by a cyclopean wall all around the south the site supporting a, a rubble filling and a wall so you see that the three are intermingled and uh, it's very complicated to reconstruct the stratigraphy and uh, to dig them we are doing this we are also re refurbishing them and uh, uh, but this uh, impressive fortification give evidence of very precise uh, stages of the life of the city when one of these systems was abandoned and destroyed and another one was built so we have material and the first relevant uh, the the reconstruction of the the city happened in the first decades of the second millennium between 2000 to one um, uh, 1950 then there was something which happened about 1800 bc and uh, we are looking for the responsible we don't know we received this picture but we don't know if he was uh, what we can say is that the egyptians were interested in uh, southern palestine and especially in jericho because the oasis they liked it it was an environment similar to their and uh, the the dwelling quarter just aside uh, the tower as this tower from one side has a, str a street and possibly was one of the uh, external entrances to the site but we don't know because there was the cyclopean wall which has destroyed everything and from the other side there was a, a very crowded areas of uh, of um, of houses which we have been excavating in the last years and uh, here you see the carvilinear, the cyclopean one, and the end over it, inside it, and so earlier than it, the um, carvilinear stone structure, which uh, very 
quite strange features such as this bastion, which is protruding, but without a wall on the back. And inside there were interesting layers of collapse you see here, uh, from where a lioness figure was found, which is intriguing because you know that the lioness is a very important symbol in the archaeology of the Near East, connected with the goddess Ishtar. So that's why we spent the last season opening over here. It was a very hard task because there are meters of rubble filling of the rampart. Again, a section of the rampart, how it worked, the last one with the triangular walls and the mud brick wall on top. And what happened in the Spring Hill? In the Spring Hill, we, uh, we could reconstruct a palace and uh, a temple and a fortification, which since the beginning remained used just for the central area, the Spring Hill. And uh, uh, so you see how I reconstruct this with this gate over here from Garstang excavations, this one. And then we even could reconstruct two palaces, one over the other. These are my diary drawings. Because this is, and here we found the earliest palace by the other is the latest one. The earliest is connected with the street excavated by Gars, uh, by Canyon, which is very famous, with the stables. And now we know that these stables and this street led to an entrance, which was over here, to the palace. While this is earlier, sorry, uh, we had restored this, the early Bronze Age. But here you see the entrance of the Middle Bronze Age. And at the end, what came out is that there is a palace with two courtyards and stables, different entrances, and a burial underneath that we will deal with the shape of the palace or the idea of the palace. It's not far away from some very important example known from the Middle Bronze Age all over the Syria, Palestine. Underneath the palace, there was a burial. This burial was excavated in 1999, and, and, but only after 10 years, I became aware that among the uh, items connected with the two burial persons, which are a, a young lady, 12, 14 years old, and uh, uh, an old lady, there was a, a, a signet ring with a scarab, and in the scarab, there was a title because this fish with this canal is a title in Egypt. That means Ajmer, means administrator of canals, is a title like vizier of the old kingdom, which sometimes is kept in some nomos also in the second millennium. So I had the idea that of reading the two following hieroglyphics, which make no sense in hieroglyphics alone, as the hieroglyphic writing of the Canaanite, that means West Semitic name of the site. And this may be the, uh, let's say, the family signet ring of the rulers of Jericho. And this could be the name of the site, Ruha. Ruha uh, makes sense. Uh, the traditional interpretation is just Jericho is from an ancient Canaanite Yerak root that means moon and also is connected to an old West Semitic uh, deity. Of course, the term might be also related with the modern Arabic name of the city, Ariha, that, that can be translated shant or perfume or fragrance or even spirit. And it's the same meaning uh, in, in the, the root as the same meaning in Hebrew. And uh, this may be in connection with flowers of us, your sandals, ointments, and perfumes produced in Hellenistic and Roman times. The scarab inscribed in hieroglyphics, thus dating from the Middle Bronze Age to the Egyptian 13th dynasty, 1750 BC, about, bears the ancient tra name of the site also occurring in Egyptian sources with the title of its ruler. The Jericho name transformation is analogous to that of Kura to Rushalimum, attested in Gypsum execution text and in the Amarna tablets, and transformed into Jerusalem. No, it was called Rushalimum, it was called Ruha. So now we have this piece of evidence 
we are going through the Egyptian documentation and the results are puzzling. <laughs> and I don't want to go also into this because otherwise it's a two days lecture. And what is important what the, of this is that uh, the canonized lords of Jericho were part of the Ixos world in Egypt, because in Jericho, it's kind of with the name of Pharaoh's Ardmierotef Otepibra was found, and it's the only attestation of the name of these important pharaohs of the 13th dynasty, except from his scepter or his club, which was found in the tomb of a king of Ebla. So this is really amazing. And uh, <coughs> one has to remember that Hodebi Bra uh, had, according to Manfred Bidak, uh, he reigned in Teledaba, ancient Tavaris, and he bore the title of son of the Asiatic, an epithet which may reflect the special relationship established between Egypt and Syria Palestine during the Second Intermediate Period. The only other attestation of this personage outside Egypt, except Ebla, is Jericho, where there are several scallops with its name tree. And one is found in the site, and two from the antique market, but told to be found in Jericho. <clears throat> so here you see other burials in the uh, Spring Hill. And these are all ballets of the members of the royal family or the clan, the ruling elite. And uh, you see also that Jericho has plenty of evidence showing a strict connection in this period with Taledaba. Then, of course, from the same area, amazing finds, again found by Garstang, but which we can now connect with the remains of a main building unfortunately badly destroyed by previous excavations at Byzantine pits, which may be is a temple like the Arars known aside palaces in that time. You see here some comparisons, the remains and the finds connected with this area, this building, which uh, uh, again seems related to some cult activities uh, of course, also the Middle Bronze Age necropolis gives us plenty of information about the society of the Middle Bronze Age. And these are very famous finds from the tombs. And uh, the last stage of the city is that of the Cyclopean Wall. And the Cyclopean Wall looks here, goes again all around the spring. So the spring was inside the site. And this is a picture taken from the drone two weeks ago, which for the first time shows the site as it is, a very huge site. And this part was included into Tel -e Sultan, that in the foreground. And we can, I think, uh, uh, conclude with this reconstruction of the city of Jericho at the mid of the um, 16 or 7 uh, 16th century before Christ. Of course, also this city arrived to a terrible destruction, and we are carefully collecting the seeds, barbed seeds from very reliable, already published context to give a, a reliable date. Up to now, we are about this for the final destruction of the Middle Bronze Age, that is 1550-1530 but uh, we have not yet published the final article on radiocarbon about this because we want to have more more data you need more than 100 dated calibrated uh, and dated uh, seeds from reliable context to suggest something in this field who was responsible again we have we can choose from very friendly neighbors of the of the Palestinians, Canaanites at that time. Of course, the site was occupied in the late bronze. And there is again evidence, and we even found evidence. This is dated 2019. The milk bowl that everybody knows of the uh, 14th century found on top of the palaces. 
the reason because late bronze is is, is not very uh, nicely preserved is it depends on the organization and of, on the uh, of the site and of its continuous construction but there is clear evidence that up just upon the cyclopean wall as it uh, was no more a supporting wall for a rubble filling there was a reconstruction in the late bronze as in many other sites of the southern levant made of bricks i uh, and of course there is evidence that it occurred between the 14th and the 13th but especially in the 14th century in the amarna time i have to stress that the fact that you have late bronze age wall does not mean anything <laughs> because the Bible narration, which uh, I'm compelled to mention, uh, is not fixed in time, and the personage is, is a, not a historical uh, attestation in archaeology. So I found the city wall, but you have to find Captain Joshua. If you find it and you bring it to me, him to me, then we can discuss if he has something to do with El Sultan. So please move ahead and uh, other finds of the late bronze and i was want to uh, drive your attention of this tablet which is now in the rockefeller museum in the palestine archaeological museum because this is the evidence that uh, there is an archive in tel sultan it's an administrative test unfortunately very badly preserved and uh, as soon as we uh, find the other tablets we will soon inform you so this is the late bronze layer which we have been working uh, uh, some weeks ago and while on top there is this is an iron age building our iron age too. and of course there is also iron age but i can't deal with iron age now I apologize and all, uh, because the time is really uh, arriving, but I want to stress that Jericho Tel Sultan was also a very important city in the Iron Age. And uh, uh, this perhaps has to do with its fame because it was also a famous city in the time when uh, the, 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 the tradition of the Bible became to be a more uh, rational connected and uh, i have just uh, uh, to show you some other finds and i want to thank you for your kind attention i apologize for the length of the lecture but you can understand that i've crossed uh, at least 10 millennia so please uh, accept my apologies bye bye Lorenzo Negro, Sapienza University of Rome.